uh, square root of 3 times uh, uh, e, uh, yes, times uh, i to the second power over 1,000, uh, cosine the uh, uh, alpha, that's very good. Yes, oh, I love to sit and read. Uh, some people, you know, enjoy reading novels. Uh, other people enjoy collecting stamps. And uh, then there's guys that get their kicks out of sitting around and uh, laughing over amusing equations. <laughs> Nothing more amusing than a well-placed cosine over the square root of minus J. <laughs> I'll tell you, comes the right time, you just knock the hell out of you. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's like the other day, I saw a guy sitting in a train and he was working this uh, crossword puzzle. And uh, as he worked the crossword puzzle, he kept chuckling over it. And it was a crossword puzzle published by the Manchester Guardian. Now, uh, the Manchester Guardian's crossword puzzle has not been known as one of the big boffolas in my life, but this guy was chuckling away. So I have to say, every man to his own thing. In fact, I had an aunt uh, named Clara, Aunt Clara, who used to sit by the hour and watch the aphids on her ferns. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to put her down for that. It's, uh, they're all, you know, it's a thing, and she sit there. Gave, we gave her. I say that we're only here, all of us, for a short period of time, comparatively. And uh, we have to find our pleasures where we may as we wander through this veil of tears. Do you agree? So I'm not going to put anybody down who sits and watches the 37th rerunning of what was initially a bad Lucille Ball episode in the first place. If this is what does it, this is what does it. I'm not... The hell, you know, that's what's called tolerance. Right? <laughs> you know, the word tolerance itself uh, implies a certain intolerance, doesn't it? Of course. That's right. People who are tolerant are always passing judgments. I mean, I like a good, honest, unreconstructed redneck who spits tobacco juice. You know where he is, you know? <laughs> you just get out of your car and start fist fighting. There's never any in between arguing uh, back and forth. Now, let's see. Before we get started here, let's get a couple of these things out of the way. We got a list here tonight that is longer than my arm. How about that thing? What does it say? Time Magazine, for heaven's sakes. Time Magazine. What's in it for you this week? Cover story. Last week, China's Premier Zhou Enlai was savoring one of his greatest triumphs, his reconfirmation as Premier, a surprise victory for moderation and stability, a turn away from ideological experimentation. But can he make it work? Time explores the complexities of Chinese politics, shows you what's at stake and who's who in the hierarchy. And in Time's other departments this week. In Nation, how the Democrats' assault on the seniority system in the House swept three Southern chairmen out of power. In Economy and Business, the pros and cons of gas rationing, what it would save, what it would cost, who'd get hurt. In art, time visits a retrospective of one of America's first abstract painters, Arthur Dove. And looks back over the 70-year career of that grassroots giant of painting, Thomas Hart Benton. In Time's essay, A History of Political Cartoons, the lively art of ego puncture from Tammany Hall to Watergate. It's all in Time magazine this week. News you can think about. Talk about. News. Each week throughout the world, more people get their news from Time than from any other single source. Pick up a copy today. Wow, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's an official sponsor, for heaven's sakes, Time. I mean, you can't get more official than that. That's the voice of the establishment itself, isn't it? It's indeed, the world circulating you know, all the whole bit. They've always had a thing on China, haven't they? I mean, if you follow Time at all, you know, they're still hanging around that China thing. <laughs> they never can give up on it. <laughs> First it was, uh, what was his name, Chiang Kai-shek? And now it's an in-depth study of... Well, so we go. You know, you've you got to keep your hands on the oars. You really do. And, uh, of course, the vague suspicion that all of us have is that the rowboats were all quietly rowing across the sea of life in our lonely way. Our rowboats made out of a bad grade of sugar. They melt. And uh, <laughs> there's no way to no way to patch the leaks, man. <laughs> oh, well, it's, uh, it's life. Uh, hey, you know, uh, uh, may I, may I uh, do something... Uh, uh, I, I'm going to warn you, if, uh, if there's any kids listening, be careful tonight. Uh, put them away, stick them in the john or something, lock the door. This is a non-kid show tonight. <laughs> Did any of you see uh, Play Misty for me? Did you see the movie? You didn't. I I'm surprised. What's the matter with you guys? You know, you guys all go see some miserable film by uh, Bogdanovich, but you miss a real film. It's about a real thing. 
unfortunately, that's what's happening to our intellectual life. Everybody's down there seeing the newest June Allison revival, and uh, they missed the atom bomb that blew up Trenton. But uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, Play Misty for me is a Clint Eastwood film, and a remarkable film because it deals with something that very few references are ever made to. Uh, so for those of you who didn't see it, there's no point in me talking about it, except that uh, Clint Eastwood in the film uh, is a guy who is working in a small radio station. He is a, uh, a, a kind of DJ, although in the novel it was a little closer to what I do. He was not a disc jockey much. Uh, the guy had a certain thing that he did that seemed to get people involved in what he was thinking always, and they, they, they related to him often in a very uh, uh, way. In fact, uh, often illogically and uh, totally, uh, totally uh, occasionally irrationally. Well, uh, now I've got a couple of letters about this. In fact, uh, the reason I'm doing this tonight, I want to talk about that film. And if you didn't see it, well, there was an old army expression that we used to use that contained two letters. One was a T and the other was an S. You just put them together, friend, and you got what it's all about. So <laughs> forget it. <laughs> but if you did see the film, you know that the guy got a girl, kept calling him up, and she wanted him to play this record. She kept saying, oh, please play Misty for me. And uh, he was playing this. Of course, this was not a, a conventional DJ show. He had a very personal approach, a very personal kind of thing. It wasn't, a, it wasn't a top 20 or a top 40 show, which is, you know, turned out like so much popcorn. You can't really get involved. This guy had a very personal show and was on a small station. And, uh, and I, I won't tell you the rest of the story. If you didn't see it, too bad. If you did see it, you know what happened. He got ultimately uh, out of it got out of control completely his involvement with this and he didn't really have much of an involvement with it but ultimately she wound up uh, murdering a couple of people and, and attempting to murder him now a lot of people seeing that film would probably think this is just uh, an unrelated horror film you know the trouble is we see so much horror on on the TV and so much violence on TV that we tend to think of it as a show it's a show. You don't really think of yourself as ever being involved in a situation like this, especially if it's horror. You can see murder, you can see crime, but horror, no. Now, uh, <laughs> in, a, in short, you, you watch you watch a, a film like, say, uh, we just take let's take a great classic, uh, of Frankenstein. Uh, you can't imagine yourself going home to the Bronx one night, you know, after working your day out uh, uh, at the office you get you get on the double e train or you get on the pelham local or something you know and you get off of somewhere in the bronx and you're walking down the street <laughs> you know just off fordham road and all of a sudden you see coming out of the alley this thing going <laughs> you know <laughs> you can't you, you know you, you wouldn't buy it you know you'd say oh come on cut it out will you what are you trying to do <laughs> it's, oh come on you're kidding <laughs> come on i know you hockey <laughs> And the next thing you know, your dismembered remains are found. And uh, you just don't buy it. We've seen so much uh, horror in films that we don't buy the concept except as a film. <laughs> That's something else. So uh, I'm afraid that a lot of people watching this movie probably figured this is just a great script and that was the end of it. Well, I am not going to say any more about that except to say that... Uh, that there are very close parallels in that film. Not only close parallels, but actual repetitions of actual events that have happened to me in this business. Now, it's, it's long been my feeling, uh, working in media, it's long been my feeling that we've created a new kind of psychosis in our, t in our time. Now, whether psychosis is the proper word, I don't know. A new kind of mental problem, and that could be called, for want of a better name, I've seen this referred to in any of the psychological or sociological literature. Maybe I'm coining the phrase, I don't know. Uh, for want of a better phrase, I could call it the media neurotic. The media sickie. 
It's a new kind. This never, it was totally out of the can of a Freud. Freud would never have known this because obviously Freud was 19th century. Media as we know it today, I'm talking about instantaneous personal electronic media, was not known in his day. Uh, not certainly to the extent that we have it at all. There were the beginnings, the very beginnings of wireless communication occurred during his time, but not radio and television as a as an entertainment and as a personal communicative form didn't exist in the early days of Marconi. No way. Uh, it was used for message sending, like the telegraph wires. Uh, you don't think of the telegram as a as an entertainment medium, <laughs> and yet uh, uh, it never would have occurred to a Marconi that we would have today, say, a Shepherd. It would never have occurred to Marconi that there would be a Johnny Carson. Uh, so Freud would not know about this problem, and it's a growing problem because I see all kinds of wild evidences of it everywhere I look. In other words, the person who is totally hung, for whatever reasons, there's a complex uh, a series of reasons that go back into this, why this person is this way, and it doesn't affect, it was just like anything else. Why do some people turn out to be axe murderers and others don't? Uh, why do certain people, all growing up in the same block, for example, uh, certain people, maybe a very small minority, will turn out to be, let's say, uh, uh, violent criminals for some reason. They just they do, and the other people don't. This is always difficult for the ones who don't become a criminal to understand. How many times have you heard in a newscast uh, where some guy is picked up, some some character has uh, uh, killed seven with an axe? You know, it says axe murderer slay seven, and they pick this guy up. And uh, they're always interviewing the mother and the father and the neighbors, and they always say something like this: well, I, don't, "I just don't believe that that could have happened. I, I, I refuse to accept this uh, that that uh, John was always the nicest boy in the block." And as a matter of fact, he, the point being that, that 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 the irrational is so irrational that we cannot conceive of the irrational. This is a psychological conundrum, just like a philosophical conundrum. This is speaking conundrums. This is WOR New York. <laughs> and and uh, let's get out with a couple of these. And I, I got something to tell you tonight about, please uh, play Misty for me. And it's a pretty scary story. Uh, it's it's actually scarier than the, than the events that occurred with Clint Eastwood in the film. That was very straightforward. It was a girl got hung on this, this whole loneliness thing, and she wound up wanting to kill. But I, I can tell you a story that to this day is inexplicable, and I'll guarantee you somebody along the line connected with that film or the novel that was taken from either heard of this case or know about the incidents that, are, that were around it. I'll just let it stand for that. Uh, hit the dinger there, please. It's a brand new and of all the things brand new. Yeah. National it's brands. the traveling Grand Union Musical Company. And most stores in the land. Flouncing around in here, little tinfoil shoes. Look at that guy. Get off your knees. Sing like a man. Let's hear it, buddy. All our produce is fresh. That's Charles Nelson Riley. He's and dancing on the frozen food. Yes. Locker there. Look at him. Union, the Union. I wonder what they mean by Grand the Union. What was the union that they formed that was this... In the Grand so Union. Every day. It's a Grand Union. Grand Union. Grand Union. Grand Union. Oh, yeah, I say, uh, musical comedy fans, this week Grand Union has an all beef sale, all USDA choice. Choice beef loin, sirloin steak, or shoulder, or bottom boneless roast, each $1.29 a pound, plus Grand Union's frozen pot pies. <laughs> you got a pot frozen there. It's kind of good. 23 cents. Let's get a few of these others out of the way here. Let's see, uh, uh, something says nothing up there. Well, I'll take a chance on it. Let's see Emerson what this Park one is. Close of no, it says nothing by chance. Third What's Street that? In New what York grammar? says, The tougher things get, the better we look. More and more men who used to spend money freely, now they come to Gramercy Park to buy clothes. They look just as good as always, but without spending so much money. That's what Gramercy Park is... Selling clothing that's a lot better looking than you thought you could get for this kind of money. After 78 years of selling men's clothing to stores, now Gramercy Park sells clothing to you. Better clothes. We'd rather sell better clothes. 
Selling better clothes means never having to say we're sorry. Gramercy Park is open to 7, on Saturday to 6, and on Sunday from 10 to 5. The address is Gramercy Park Clothes, 61 West 23rd Street. That's 61 West 23rd Street in New York. This is Hugh Downs, and I'd like to tell you about a motion picture we just finished. It's a story about an America that some people think is gone, but it isn't gone at all. The film's all about a group of men who spent a summer barnstorming Heartland America in old biplanes. It features Richard Bach, who wrote the classic bestseller Jonathan Livingston's Seagull, and Nothing by Chance is a movie for the entire family. Don't miss Richard Bach's Nothing by Chance. I know you'll enjoy it. Okay, it starts Wednesday at the Fine Arts Theater in Manhattan. Check your new theater location and showtimes. And by the way, if you think those biplanes they're flying in that are World War I biplanes, you know, people keep thinking the biplane doesn't exist anymore except as a museum item, but biplanes are built to this very day. Uh, the pits, the super pits, uh, these are great uh, uh, aerobatic planes, in case you're interested in aerobatics. Uh, the greatest airplane of the world, the, the Pitts, right now, currently. Uh, well, uh, there's a few crop planes that are still built that are biplanes. And, uh, of course, there's a lot of Stearmans flying around, which were not World War I planes, but World War II planes. <laughs> the Stearman trainer. Not at all World War All right, now, let's get back to life here. Uh, you know, I... I I have I have mixed feelings about this uh, this media neurosis, and I I don't often tell uh, stories I suppose you might say or or uh, I suppose they'd be stories about what's actually happened to me personally in media. You very 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 rarely hear this now. I'll have to explain something about my experiences in media. They, they've been, uh, uh, I'm not by nature or choice a radio man per se. Uh, most of the early shows and the early work that I did in this business was working in television stations who actually had along with them a radio station as here. Uh, this station also owns a TV station. Here in New York City they're very definitely separated. But in around the country uh, most radio and television operations are combined, and so you'll find you'll find the big radio station will have a big TV station in cities like Cleveland or Cincinnati or or uh, Chicago even, and uh, quite often the performer will work both. Uh, here in New York, that's no, it's totally forbidden uh, for whatever reasons it's there, but that's not true across the country. So I my my experience with media has been not what you probably think it's been. <laughs> and uh, and I didn't work in small radio. Somebody gives uh, me I, uh, notes like as if I I must have started about the time of Graham McNamee and worked in little radio stations that were battery operated, they're wind driven. <laughs> no way. I'm sorry. I never did. In fact, uh, I haven't worked really except on one occasion in a station that was under fifty thousand watts in power. I worked, I've worked in all ma in the major cities, has been my work generally, and in major radio stations. Uh, the kind of work that I do simply doesn't go along with working in a small station. Most small p stations stri strictly stick to news and music, uh, an occasional telephone show. But to, to be able to employ a resident comic, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, that's, a, that's an unbelievable, uh, let's put it this way, that's an unbelievable uh, luxury that uh, is just not a thing that most stations do or can afford but nevertheless uh, when I was when I was working in another city not in New York you notice that the, that the movie uh, play misty for me was set in a small station now this this is for a good reason because small station operation lends its kind of thing and there's a certain kind of of neurotic who does not get hung on the big entertainer. See, don't confuse the neurotic with the fan. First thing I must say, make that differentiation very clearly. 
that a fan is somebody who merely likes the work that a person does, enjoys watching it or listening to it, and uh, may even get uh, sometimes rabid about it, just like a, a, a baseball fan will, will go out and get really, really rabid about uh, following a team. But that doesn't make him a neurotic at all. He's just an enthusiastic fan. On the other hand, a person may get, uh, let's say, anti a certain show. But that doesn't make him a neurotic either. What does make a person a neurotic is an unnatural involvement in something that has very little to do with what is actually being done by that something. In other words, groupies rarely listen to music. <laughs> okay? Uh, so that's, that's bordering on, on the neurotic, and many of them are. I've known many in my time, groupies. Uh, both the music world groupies. Did you know there's a whole subculture of sports groupies? Of girls who, who say, hang around uh, baseball teams, and that wherever the team is staying, they lurk in doorways across the street, and they, they, uh, they're groupies, they're sports groupies. Uh, there's always been groups. There's a, there's a sad crowd of people who hang around outside of the theaters here in New York City all this night after night after night. And uh, they hang around outside of Sardis. Are they interested in the theater? Don't you believe it? <laughs> no way. So, there, that, but, but the, the media group is a different story because he's alone. See, to become a stage door type, that, that is, is a group activity. They're all standing around together. But the media groupie is a solitary person in a solitary room. And uh, often, in the case of the neurotic, the only communication they've got with the outside world is this radio set. Much more often radio than television. Now, why is that? Very simple. Television is an impersonal medium. So you watch a game show. You don't think, you can't conceivably imagine that this guy's doing this for you. And uh, you and Bill Cullum are all friends. <laughs> no way. Johnny Carson, totally impersonal. He's always sitting there talking to Zsa Zsa Gabor or Victor Borga endlessly. He's not talking to you. And when he does talk, he's talking to the audience out there in the studio. They cheer and yell. Then he goes, talking to you. And you also are aware that there's others involved. You hear the people cheering and laughing. Radio presents a curious set of, of uh, conditions to the neurotic. First of all, he often believes he's the only one that is getting this. Now, a normal person wouldn't think that way. But the neurotic we're talking about, remember, that he's crossed the line of reality, and, and, or she, it's most general in this case, it was a she, that she's crossed the line of, of, of reality, and she believes this thing that's coming out is for her, and it's only for her, that all the others are intruders. And, and uh, quite often the the uh, neurosis then begins to develop, and this is one of the most constant ones I've seen in male and uh, over the years. I've even had, instance, incidentally, for your, for your benefit, there have been two attempts on my life. Now, it's no joke if, you, if you're saying I'm laughing. These are serious. Uh, one of them involved a, a, a knife, much like in the movie that you saw. And in fact, curiously enough, that knife almost looked exactly like the one she used. It was a big 12 and a half inch bread knife. It's not the shiv type. Uh, it's the kind of weapon that a woman could have access to. And it was a big bread knife. And uh, the incident occurred right here uh, on Broadway at 1440 and on a Saturday morning. And it was a wild, uh, fantastic moment. Every bit is as frightening as the moment when the girl attempted to stab Clint Eastwood in the film where she brought the knife down. Well, this woman, it was a woman in my case, a woman was attacking me from behind and I had no knowledge of it. I didn't see it. But, a, but an elevator operator happened to be standing there at that point and he saw her charging at me with a 12 and a half inch bread knife ready to plunge into my back and no matter who you are, this can hurt. <laughs> so he, he, he floored her. He didn't, he didn't say anything. He just left his feet and knocked her flat. And it was a hell of an, uh, of an uproar. The knife went skidding across the, 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 the floor. 
And uh, she screamed, you can't do this to my life, you can't do this to my life. Well, what was I doing to her life? Well, she was hearing me on the radio. And the, the, the show had become, in, uh, in her neurotic way, bound with her life. And she would build her whole day upon listening to this show. And uh, this is, again, as I said, this is a neurotic problem, uh, to the point where whatever I would say seemed to be about her about her. So if I said, it rained today, she'd say, yes, he knows. So because it rained on her too. <laughs> it seemed that I was privy to her life. You notice that most other media are not connected with the daily life. You never hear Johnny Carson mention whether it's cold or, or whether it's raining or anything. The movies never do that. Uh, Paul Newman never looks out and says, hey, you know, it's raining like hell tonight, isn't it? Let's get back to the story now. <laughs> he never does. See? In short, there's no connection between your daily life and other mediums. But there is in radio. It's an instantaneous medium. So you begin to believe, he's like me. He's living my life. Well, uh, before we go any further, I'm going to tell you a really hair-raising story. You better, you better turn your lights on. That makes the Clint Eastwood story look like greasy kid stuff. Before we do that, and this happened to me personally, this is not fiction, I'm not inventing it, this actually happened. Hit the ding dong. Open up your eyes, hey, look around you. There's a lot of world you've never seen. This year there's a new feeling among the people of Pan Am. The spirit of 75, you might say. It comes out of realizing how much the individual employee of Pan Am can accomplish. You'll see what this means the next time you fly Pan Am to the 109 cities and 72 countries we serve all around the world. chorus uh, Pan Am has daily service to sunny Jamaica as we say here in good old New Yorker uh, flight 223 leaves every evening at 510 for Kingston from Pan Am's new world port at JFK you call your old friendly travel agent for reservations um, friendly flight 223 and we have a note here from New York magazine that says uh, let's see uh, so you've gotten killed in the stock market right in the last few years and now you're down to your last 10,000 bucks, you have to invest, what do you do? You know, they just assume you have to invest all the time. Why not just put it under your mattress like ordinary, reliable, smart people do? <laughs> you always got to be down there trying to make a couple of bucks. Well, anyway, uh, New York Magazine has all this stuff about uh, uh, how you can, uh, you know, put... If I ever got down to my last 10,000 after investing, I, the first thing I would do would be to call out the firing squad about my broker. That's the first thing. I don't know why they suggest this. <laughs> I, I, I've never had a broker in my life. But would you love to know people that have brokers and all that stuff? You know, almost everyone I've ever known who's had this is a real tin pot operator. You know, some guy that's working in the mail room says, Hey, wait a minute, I'm going to call my broker. He's got four shares of Brunswick, you know, 12 cents a share, calling up. Anyway, uh, this week's New York Magazine has a lot of stuff on how to save your you-know-what if you're down to your last uh, couple of bucks in the market. And if you'd like to save your you-know-what, uh, pick up this copy, the current copy of New York Magazine. And if all else fails... My heart burns back. This pressure must be gas again. Digel has told you that acid indigestion and heartburn are often accompanied by gas. Digel calls it gasid indigestion. Now a report from the U.S. government confirms that the only ingredients recognized effective against both acid indigestion and gas are an antacid combined with cimethicone. And that's exactly what Digel is. You see, antacids alone only take care of the acid. But Digel is different. It does more. It not only reduces the excess acid, but has the unique anti-gas ingredient, cimethicone, that gets rid of the trapped gas, too. In fact, in a survey conducted among doctors who specialize in stomach disorders, 98% of the doctors responding said they've recommended products containing Digel's special anti-gas ingredient, cimethicone. No antacid alone relieves like Digel does. Use only as directed. Digel liquid or tablets for gasset indigestion in regular mint flavor and now new lemon orange 
Oh, Cy Methicone. He's working again. Remember him? He used to have that pizza joint down on 23rd Street. Well, so I got involved in the mafia, you know. And it's just you got a brides to be and mothers of brides to be come to the fair. Do they still get married? Is that still in? I guess it is. Is that a new thing? You're going to Princeton. Are they doing it again? I see. Women are coming back in style too on the campus, huh? Right? Uh, well, that's all different from the 60s. Brides to be come to the fair. The WOR Bridal Fair, that is. On February 15th and 16th, there will be a bridal fair at the American Americana Hotel in New York City. See in here a beautiful bridal and trousseau fashion show. It's going to be exciting. Detroit Stacy House Furniture with stores in Comac and Brooklyn, foremost furniture showrooms, etc. 8 West 30th Street in New York, all Providence Savings Banks in New Jersey. That's where you can get your tickets for this exciting event. Bride to be. That's right. <laughs> I, I just thought of a lot of bad jokes I could tell about that, but I will not. I will desist. Cease and desist, the way the police say. Would you please hit the uh, general button? Thank you. Yes, let's all sing it out, gang. Come on, I want to hear this loud and clear. It's our theme song here. Someday, Someday you'll own. Either that or they'll own you. Someday you'll own. Sooner or later, you'll own generals. Yeah, yeah, you know that nothing's changed, Dave. With so many new kinds of tires coming out, you know, all those bumpy ones and the square ones and all that stuff, maybe you're puzzled about making the right choice, right? Well, here's the solution. See your general tire specialist. He's trained to handle all your tire needs and automotive service problems, too. So if you need new tires, he'll be glad to explain which general tire is best for you. You're driving your budget, the way you pump it at the curbs and all that, all the time fixed up. So you go see Phil McConkey, the general tire specialist at the Gertz Car Center in Jamaica, and sing it out. Sooner or later, you'll own generals. You can't fake it. If you're a pro, you're a pro. Sooner or later, you'll own generals. Razzmatazz. Boom, boom, boom. That was nice. All right, I will tell you the story of what happened to me. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it, it forever changed my thing. Uh, I suppose you might say rationality, reality, uh, all the other things that we take for granted in our lives. Uh, it's a very odd experience. And I will tell you exactly what happened without embellishing it. Now, I was never a disc jockey in my life. Uh, I was a performer, an entertainer. I did it on television, I did it on on the radio, I also did it on the stage in the city that, that I'm discussing here at this point. However, people who are neurotic often are attached to radio more than any other medium for a number of reasons. Uh, many psychologists will tell you it's a lonely... And another thing, they tend to think, too, that nobody else is listening. You don't get this idea of television or the stage. Radio is part of uh, lonely people's lives. Three in the morning, they're out there in those dark hives, in those uh, in those uh, unimaginable cells, with the with the radio going and this voice is talking to them, and they begin to have all kinds of fantasies. Well, I began to get just out of the blue. One day, this was in Cincinnati, as a matter of fact. By the way, the actual novel that the Clint Eastwood movie was based on was not based in Carmel or LA which is or, or San Francisco which is the way this was based uh, in the movie the actual novel was based in another city anyway out of the blue one day I began to get letters of course you get thousands of letters in, in the media of all kinds over the year and uh, some of them are funny some of them are not but uh, there's a certain kind of pattern that begins to develop. And immediately, your senses, if you're into this business enough, your senses begin to uh, raise the, the little hackles on the back of your neck. See, Clint Eastwood obviously was new in the racket. He would have immediately spotted, look out. <laughs> By the way, the, the, the black DJ was very hip in the film. He's excellent. And very much like some black DJs I've known. Now, uh, at the time that this occurred to me, I was driving a car every bit as as exotic as the one that Clint Eastwood was driving. I also, by the way, was living in a very exotic house. I was living in a, in a house, that an old Victorian house that had been rebuilt overlooking the Ohio River. 
was in a very lonely spot, very much like the Clint Eastwood thing, very hip life. Uh, and uh, I knew thousands of jazz musicians, all kinds of people were in and out of my pad at all times, including guys like uh, Dave Brubeck, uh, people like uh, uh, Paul Desmond, and, and uh, it was all, uh, very much the way this, this scene was uh, in the Clint Eastwood movie. And suddenly out of the blue, I began to get letters in green ink. Now that's not in itself interesting. However, there's a certain kind of emotional instinct you develop about these things. And almost from the beginning, uh, there was something curious about these letters. There was a certain tone to them. Uh, they were written in green ink, a, a rather exotic handwriting. It was kind of backward slanting and uh, quite flowery and ornate. And uh, the, the letters always came with some kind of, of uh, face powder had been sprinkled into the letter so that when you opened it, this face powder drifted down. And it was a cloyingly sweet face powder. And uh, the, the letters were in an odd combination of English with a few French phrases thrown in. I suspect because my first name is J-E-A-N, which is a French name, Jean, uh, this woman, or this girl, assumed that I was French, so I knew this language. She kept throwing these little phrases in, but it was the powder that sort of put me off, and the smell of the letters. They were very fragrant. Well, the letters began to get more and more uh, verbose. Now, what were they verbose about? Well, that's what made them odd. They were verbose about things which had no relationship to anything I was doing. Like, for example, she would say, well, of course, you know that today I went to the bank, and uh, as I went to the bank, I was driving along, and I saw this, and I was talking to this woman, and she said so-and-so, and she was wearing that funny sweater that she always wears. Now, I've always felt about sweaters like that. She goes on and on and on. And it was obviously a, a rather young girl, I, I, I could tell. Just it was a young girl. Well, uh, the letters were getting longer and longer. And after about three or four months every day they began to arrive at fantastic frequency suddenly I was getting seven eight nine ten letters in one mail on this green ink and getting more and more I can only say feverish is the best word they were feverish a curious fervor ran through them well now it just so happened that I was doing at that time just about this, uh, everything sort of fitted together. I started to do a show in a nightclub. I was doing a nightclub show in Cincinnati. And uh, the, the show actually was broadcast uh, at the same time. At one time it had been TV. We did some TV stuff. We also broadcast on the radio, much the way I did a show here a few years ago at the Limelight. It was actually a nightclub show that was broadcast. Well, I had a buddy who was an engineer friend of mine. And, and uh, we'd go down to, to, uh, to set this thing up earlier and... Uh, and it was a big nightclub, very big, popular one in Cincinnati. Well, out of the blue, I got a package. It just came to the to the station, and it was a, like many packages come. People will send things to you, but this package was unbelievable. It was heavy, big. It was a big, thick package. It was about oh, I'd say seven, eight inches thick, about the size of a Sears Roebuck catalog. It was. Opened it up, and it's a it's. It's the biggest, longest, most unbelievable letter I've ever... It was a letter of about a thousand pages in length, written in green ink and packaged, a continuous letter. You imagine? Can you imagine getting a thousand-page letter, finely written in tiny handwriting? Well, one night, I, I, I was getting worried about this, really worried, because it seemed to have overtones that, that, uh, that really started to scare me. Well, one night... Uh, we were setting up and there were people arriving in the nightclub when all of a sudden I became aware of sitting down in this, the scary stuff, okay? <laughs> I have to explain it to you, the tape. No, don't, don't do it, we've blown it. Don't, don't do it now, don't do it, we've blown it. So you have to swing me on these things. So, I, uh, that night, I see down in the, in the, in the crowd, I instantly knew there was this strange-looking, very thin, hawk-faced girl with unbelievably burning eyes wearing what looked like a big leopard-skin beret, strange-looking hat. 
and just looking with no no blinking eyes just intense intense looking at me and she's down in this crowd and I turned to my friend my and Jess look out I think we got something going tonight and uh, he says yeah he says I think we have went right in the middle of the show as I'm performing on stage she got up off of her, her off of her seat and walked forward and laid on the stage right in front of everybody she laid a package that was thinly wrapped with tissue paper in a box and uh, I, I paid no attention to her I just went right on well, Bob very carefully opened it off stage and in the box was a doll painted black wearing a red lined cape Wait a minute, just think about this. This was a male doll painted jet black wearing a cape that had been put on it, red lined. Just, that's all there was to it. At that point, I began to see that there was more going here, Fred, than I had bargained for. And that was the beginning of one of the most bizarre, fantastic event. Well, can you imagine coming out, two years later, coming out, of a, of a television radio station in Philadelphia at two o'clock in the morning in a driving rain with my MG parked out in front and standing in the doorway across the street is the girl wearing the same leopard skin beret just watching me everywhere I went and what it finally resulted in would make I have to say it would make the Clint Eastwood movie look like an episode of the Bobsy Twins. It wound up with six people dead. Fantastic scene. And, and it was a saga that went over seven years with this woman constantly pursuing a girl, really. She was only in her mid, early, early 20s, roughly. And she changed until she finally became wild shrike with burning eyes with only one desire and that was to kill and guess who that is right